Uh, they have, in western New York, a lot of spring boxes. Everything runs off, and that's how they get their water. And, and it's not the job of DEC minerals to tell them your water's bad. So we would have to go to the health department, the county health department, and say, you better go and investigate this. Here's, here's, the, here's the results that we have. So it's a, it's a loaded question. Because what you ask is a loaded question. On the other hand, testing for, for, for bacteria, etc., there are things that you can do to treat it. Yes. If you've got benzene in the water and targeting and other things, firstly, you're not testing for it. And secondly, there's no way you can get it out. Well, Except where you can, but it's a very expensive process. Yes, true. But there's no benzene and toluene being used as any of these chemicals in frac. That's, no, that's, uh, that's not to my knowledge. No, that's, that, not that's Well, that's... Mind you, if the industry was a little more um, transparent about what it uses, we would be able to have a, uh, a clear well, idea. I, there, I don't think there's any question about it that, that, that uh, if you go to frac focus, do you know frac focus .org, mm -hmm. and the companies are reporting? I, I believe New York is going to mandate that they report all their chemicals in the practice. Well, I hope so. Yeah. I think it's going to happen. Okay. It's it certainly got, it's, they already have to, it's mandated now in the SGIS. Uh, that, that brings up another question. Be, uh, before, I'm sorry, sir, let, okay. me, let, me, no, let me take your question. Well, he brought in a part of it. You talked about there's pollution in, in our water normally. But when we try to find out what chemicals are used in the fracking, we get this as priority. We, you know, we can't divulge that. Why? I, I don't understand why. I, I think it's a bunch of bullshit, to be honest. Oh, okay. Okay? Excuse my English here, but there's four, there's basically four chemicals that are used in the frac fluids. Um, a surfactant. And a, a biocide. Uh, sand, of course, is a propagant. Um, what? No, gelant. Isn't there? Uh, some gelant. Gelant, but that's, that's, I've got them down here. But anyway, it, it, what happens, and, and what the regulatory agencies do, uh, they've confused the issue. There's only four, basically four chemicals, and they're nothing more than you, you know things that you use around the house. At, at, a, at, a, at a concentration of 0 0.5 ppm. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what? so the problem, so what, what's happened is they made a list of every chemical ever used, and it looks to, to people, including all the public, including DEC, when you look at the thing, that they're using 1,000 or 10,000 chemicals. So as a, as a, as a list, They've done it. Now, to get to your question, um, you, the, the ever popular Halliburton may have a mix of these four chemicals. And they, and they just like their Coca Cola, it's a proprietary mix. That's what they're saying they don't want to disclose. And that, but that information will go to the DEC now under, under freedom, uh, it will go under trade secret. I believe after the SGIS is here. So, and and there's a, also a provision within the SGIS which says. And, and let me ask you this: How many people have read the SGIS? See, see, that's another thing. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of information in that SGIS, even the 1992 the GEIS. So when you talk about something, and I'll, and I'll give you some shortcuts if you don't want to read the 1,500 pages. If you read Appendix Six. And Appendix 10, you will get the gist of pretty much everything that's in the everything that's being required of the oil and gas industry. And if you read Chapter 7 on mitigation, you'll get pretty much all the, the thought process and how they are going through this. So these four, basically these four classes of chemicals, and I'll go through what what hydrofracking looks like in a minute. But let me answer this challenge. Well. Um... One, one issue is the chemicals that are used by the companies with, that are injected. But when the wastewater comes out, it's full of brine that, that uh, has heavy metals in it and uh, radioactive uh, elements. And there isn't any um, wastewater treatment plant in the country that can actually clean that uh, type of uh, contaminant. That's so true, what do you do with true, it? Not true, not true. Well, some of it's true. 
<laughs> let, let, let's go, let me, before we get into that, let's go, let me go through this. Uh, yes, yes. Well, while you're talking about the um, uh, chemicals that are composed, that, that go into these um, act fracking activities, I think there's a couple of other things that would make a more complete picture. There is, in most um, fracking fluid, some kind of, um, well, originally it was diesel, fuel itself. And the putting back in of diesel fuel was outlawed. And the companies, the industry actually agreed to that. And then several of them have self-reported that they kept using diesel fuel in their uh, fluids even after they had promised that they weren't going to use it. When they don't use it, they have to use something else. And that's where that class of benzene, toluene, something in the uh, the aromatic hydrocarbons is put in to keep the stuff slippery and sliding. It's, it's, it's not that. It's well, not benzene and toluene. It, it's nothing like that. Those are These the fuels now used that the industry right. supplies. So I'm only going to what let me, they let say. Me back, let me back up for a second. Well, can I finish what yeah, I'm going to say and then you can reply to all of it? Let me just tell you that diesel fuel is never used in the state of New York. And, and I was shocked when I saw that diesel fuel was ever used as a fracking fluid. And uh, that was used someplace out west, at Colorado maybe. No, it was in the United States, huh? including New York. No, no, never used in New York. So, but go ahead. But what, I'm, what I was going to say to you about the benzene is, there are sometimes in some of these formations, if you as you go as you go west to Ohio, you go from a real dry gas in New York to to hydrocarb to uh, oil. And so you will get traces of benzene or, or uh, other, it's nothing that's, nothing that's been put into the well, but you will get those traces of oil back sometimes in the, in the frac fluids or in the, in the production fluids as you go past a lot of these formations. My understanding of the composition of these fluids is the reason, I agree with you that there's only a small number of categories of compounds, but my understanding was that the industry would often use small amounts of many chemicals in each of those categories so that they can report out that they have tiny concentrations of ethyl methyl, uh, benzene, toluene, you know, tetra, unpronounceable. Um, and if you have in category of surfactant, if you have 20 different surfactants, then each one of them will be reported as a very small concentration, whereas you still have a very large concentration of surfactants. So I think that's the picture of why you have these long lists that industry is supplying of all the chemicals they could use, and then they can report that they're all in very tiny concentrations. Yes. <laughs> Actually, that's... The total concentration of the chemicals is, le is less than 1%. Yeah, but you're using million 5 million gallons, million gallons times 1%. It's still a large, large, amount, yeah, but you're, large you're, volume of some of these chemicals. And some of these chemicals are toxic in parts per million or parts per billion. By well, your own admission, uh, the formula, the formula 4 apparently, is going into uh, to a very clandestine Nobody will ever know what the real content of that is, Halliburton, and what you've just well, been through. They'll know. I mean, the, so it, it doesn't matter because we're arguing something that, if, if it's that secret, you know, whatever the formula is, we'll never know it. Well, I guess the DEC will know. And yeah, what's the, the oversight on that? I'm sorry, what, what is What's it? the oversight on that? Well, DEC is going to DEC is going to review all the frac fluids that go into every every single well, and in fact, there's a provision in there which says that they have to evaluate the frac fluids uh, to find to to justify using a frac fluid when there's a better alternative, uh, a green a more green frac frac fluid. And what will happen with the findings of that? The same people that. Uh, determine the formulation or agree upon it. Well, we'll May I make a suggestion? Let's not get stuck on the fact that we're done. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be recorded. I mean, I don't know what else you want. It's, it's just like Coca-Cola doesn't put out, tell you exactly what's in their Coca-Cola. I don't believe anything. Well, okay. Can yes, we continue? Well, let's continue. Okay. 
Well, I wanted to know if the DEC has adequate regulatory staffing in order to be able to, to do everything it's supposed to be doing? No, not close. Okay. How not close, it, but, how is it going to but let, me, let me tell you, uh, we're, we're jumping subjects here because I wanted to get back to, the, to, this, to okay. this fracking. So but let me just say that the list that they've put together for staff that they need is so far off the charts that it's absolutely ludicrous that they would ask for hundreds and hundreds of people to justify all the people that they've lost over time. The Division of Mineral Resources needs staff. They need, I said 30 <coughs> last time, this was in 2009 when I made a presentation to the Business Council, they maybe need 50 or, or 75 people. But what they've also said is we're not going to issue any permits, uh, any more permits that we can handle with the people we have. But the but the but the the, the kinds of the kinds of numbers that you've seen in the press are ridiculous, and I'll, and, and as we get through this tonight, uh, I'll tell you that it's not going to be we we will be lucky to have any oil and gas industry in the state uh, if the SJS goes in the way it is now. We will not have the kind of impact that. Uh, Pennsylvania has had. Pennsylvania has 70% of the, I know, you're saying that's good, right? Yeah, but, but where are you going to get the energy? Why, why, and this is what I was going to tell We need to make, we need to make sound energy choices. And I want to talk about that subject in a minute. Well, let's we'll talk about that. Let's talk about the Goose Bay facility that's being built to export gas. Let's, uh, let's raise our about hands about when you want to ask a question, okay. please, well, and then he'll about ask you. Okay, we're jumping subjects. Let, let me go back to this, because I want to make a point about this hydrofracturing, so people understand what we're saying. The well bore, what did I tell you? This is the most important, this is the most important part of this. This, horse, this vertical well, this horizontal leg, what they do is they drill down a mile, and they drill over a mile. They could hit a marble. Think about that. That's that's. We're talking about a high, very high tech industry. Probably the most uh, most high tech industry we have, with the exception of the computer industry, and the biggest users of computers. And and believe it or not, they have an outstanding environmental record, particularly offshore, where they they do uh, really amazing things. But I just want to show you. What, what happens down here is, what happens is that a little gun goes down and shoots holes. They, they, they close this off, put a packer in there, just put, put a packer in here. And this goes and shoots holes, shoots holes through the casing and through the cement, through the concrete, okay? The, you know, you know the difference between cement and concrete? Cement, cement is what you dig out of the ground. Concrete is what you have. In this industry, they call it cement. But, it, but that's not the accurate thing. Anyway, so then a million gallons of water comes down here under pressure with the, with the four things, not diesel. With the, with the four things, not diesel. With the four things and sand. And they, and they pressure it up and make these cracks. This water is at 500 feet. This formation is at 5,000 feet. And this frac fluid goes down, one million gallons goes down, and probably 150,000 comes back. Comes, that's called flowback. Okay? This is the part I want you to understand. There is no way for this fluid to go vertically to get up into the fresh water. Okay? There are two reasons for that. And then, by the way, there's, a, there's another chapter in the, in the SJS. But it's basically what's called Darcy's Law. The, this is under pressure. This is, a, this is, like, this is so dry, it's like a, uh, like a cinder block. Okay? If you poured water on a cinder block, it would just soak up that water and you wouldn't get you wouldn't get low. That's where that. That's where all that eight and a half, uh, eight eight hundred and fifty thousand gallons of water is going. It's going into the formation. And it's not coming back. Now, 
Because, because this is a hole, okay, the, the gas is going to flow towards the hole. And every, everything is going to flow towards that hole. So there's no way that something is going to go vertically against gravity with 4,000 feet, let's say, of rock. It, it can't, this is called cap rock. It can't go, it can't go in that direction. Yes, ma'am. This is the theory, but there's a couple of problems with it. One is, especially in this region, the uh, layers are not uh, horizontally stacked layers because of the glaciers. All of these layers are intermixed, and there's even shale layers that come to the surface. So everywhere there's a plane that cuts across the horizontal, you have interconnections between these layers. And so over geologic time, that 850,000 gallons can move around. Beyond that, there's now computer modeling that shows that when you do fracture, you actually move apart small planes. And over a course of uh, months, years, tens of years, or hundreds of years, you, uh, on computer modeling, show that this kind of <coughs> um, very rudimentary model of stacked horizontal plates just isn't true. You get more fracturing, and, and immediately after the explosion, yes, you get just the rocks pressing together and nothing moves. But the whole point is to prop those fractures open. And in doing that, you create fractures, and as we now know, earthquakes. And then there's experimental science that shows that there's thermogenic methane, deep methane, that is more present in wells that have been fracked than, than you, you find you've said, anywhere you're else. Wait, wait, no, you've so there's three different ways you've got three, of you, yeah, yeah, Let's go through this thing one at a time. Okay, that'd be good. The first thing okay. is that if you, if you notice in the G, in G, Marcellus, Okay, the Marcellus Formation, outcrops in Marcellus, New York. That's how they name formations. You a geologist? Uh, no. Okay, I'm not either. I'm not either. So, and I, and I can tell you that I know about this much about geology, even though I've worked in it for so long. So, we're on the same team here. Okay. We're um, gonna leave things that we don't know unknown. Right. But there are. Well, no, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, there's some things I do know. What, what I'm saying to you is that there's no gas in those and that Marcellus that comes out of the ground in Marcellus, okay? That's, that's dissipated over time. So in the, in the SGIS, you cannot drill a Marcellus well unless it's at least 2,500 feet deep. Right. Do you know that? Yeah, but if you're giving generic permitting, you may be doing that in a region that is right near a fault that goes up to the surface. You're not doing geologic evaluations prior to each drilling. If you were doing that, then I would be a lot happier. You you have you have uh, uh, don't short don't don't uh, shortchange the guys at DEC people at DEC. They know what they're doing. I'm talking about the minerals people. But you got you. You're gonna oh, well, yell. I just wonder, do, does the DEC have to do what the governor wants? Are they a, really an independent agency? No, the governor has, the governor, the, the person who's going to make a decision on this, if you believe, not, if you don't believe in politics, is Martens. Not, not the governor, but the governor tells Martens he's going to do it, he's going to do it. Or he's going to find somebody else that's going to do it. Right, well, wait, we're jumping. I want to, I want to finish with my discussion here. Um, your first point, when I talked about that. The second point, that... Computer modeling now demonstrates... Well, that's, that's not exactly right either, because if you look at the... Uh, there's also a... a, a uh, I'm trying to think... Pinnacle. There's a Pinnacle study. When they went down here and they, and they mapped all the, every single Marcellus well uh, in Pennsylvania, I think in West Virginia, or whatever, and they actually mapped the extent of the, of the fractures. And they showed on a map, and it's in the SGS someplace, that, you know, there's a minimum of 3,000 or 4,000 feet between the fractures and any fresh water. That map is not actually a map, it's a competing computer model, and so I'll give you that. But there's no actual uh, physical documentation or analog to that map, 
because you can't get beyond the initial fractures and see what's happening. But that's not a it's computer model. model. That's actual measure. It's projected from what the industry says. And like you no, said, they're, they they're have actually, a lot of act, It's actual measurement. It's measurement. It's measurements, but there's no comparison with a picture or anything else. The industry has created the technology that creates those drawings, and then they say, these drawings show X and Y. But there's no way that they, as far as I can have found it to date, can show me a gold standard that validates their supposed measurements. There's no independent validation of their models. What, so what would it take for you to believe that after they crashed 14,000 wells in the Barnett Shale, with essentially no problems. What would it take to convince you that this is that this technology is as safe as any technology ever ever done ever done to, to recover resources in the country? That's the problem. I don't think there's anything that's going to satisfy uh, any any industry. You know, it isn't like you don't ask. You don't ask a professor at Cornell, by the way, uh, and, that, and you, you made a couple of other erroneous statements about fracking causing earthquakes. It isn't fracking. That's not the problem. The problem is, the problem is deep well disposal. That was Ohio. In you, the UK, the, the government determined that fracking caused the earthquakes that they observed. So I'm I can't speak. I can't speak. I can't speak to that. Uh, all I know is that fracking does not cause, fracking has never been shown in this country to cause an earthquake. Yeah. Has yeah. been demonstrated yet. Yeah. Correct. Yes, ma'am. Um, if you say that this is one of the safest technologies around, why is it that there are so many reports of people who live in drilling areas, fracking areas, who are getting really, really sick? with things like cancers, chemical sensitivities, all kinds of crazy reactions that in some cases doctors don't know how to treat. I, I don't, you know, for first of all, uh, I don't know, any time, if, if, a, if, a, if a, there are a lot of people, you know, let's take the Toyota situation with bricks, right? All of a sudden people came out of the woodwork and said, the car can't, doesn't stop. It just continues, and it took it took a National Academy of Sciences group to determine that there never was a problem. So why do people complain about that? Now, would sickness are people getting sick about things? I, I don't I don't know. I mean I, that's a, this is beyond me. But there's no way if if in New York if if we've already put in place mitigation for. Uh, exposure to frac fluids. As small as this half half a percent may be, and I want to get back to that in a minute, get back to the, to the flow back, which was I think your question. Um, as small as, as that may be, all of the all of the frac fluids are going to be put in tanks. And the tanks are going to be taken away. Wait, wait, wait. What about the what? big, huge wastewater ponds and things like that's that? Not, that's not frac fluid. No. Nope. not fluid, no. That's not not frac. Water. Not fr flow back. Flow back. Anything with chemicals like, like this that were introduced, with the exception of drilling muds, and there may be some oil oil based drilling muds, but anything, anything like any frac fluid, that's what I'm saying. You, you know, you got to go back and look at this SGIS because the SGIS has a tremendous amount of detail in it about how they're going to do certain things. Everything is going in our state. Everything is going in these in these uh, uh, tanks. So nothing's going to touch the ground. Not the frac fluids. What you're going to have in ponds is the drilling fluid, which is basically the cuttings. Okay, it's just like dirt coming out of the hole when you drill the hole plus anything they've used to uh, lubricate. Sometimes they use oil, oil-based. It's more like a, a, a mineral oil now that they're using. And, and we, Lake Country, for example, has a way to treat those. <coughs> Actually, so you're, you're saying that the produced water is basically going to be... Well, you, you, okay. you're, you're getting back to produced water. No, I'm just, I just want yeah, to be No, 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 this is, this is, you're, you're, you're right. There's a lot of confusion about the different, 
the different kinds of weights. We have frac flowback, we have production water, and then we have uh, drill cuttings and weights. And I guess that's about it. What's the difference between flat, frac flowback water and, produ and produced water? Nothing. Oh. Well, this is. I'll tell you what the. I'll tell you what the regulatory difference is. This comes back immediately mm -hmm. after you put down. Remember, I talked about 150,000 gallons coming back. That's flowback. I think the the agency, DEC, is going to look at this and say, okay, when. When, uh, uh, when the well goes into production, now that production water will be treated like frac water. Because in fact, it's still taking some chemicals out of the, uh, uh, excuse me, out of the formation. So, so you're gonna get some chemicals back in this production water. But what about also the radioactive elements and the heavy brines and the heavy metals and all that stuff well, that comes with it that's associated with you, the shale? Okay, when you, get, when you get frac, when I, I'm, this is what I wanted to talk about. When you get the frac fluids back, as somebody said, you get some formate, you get some, uh, uh, you get barium coming out of the formation and forming and, and, and collecting with the chloride and creating barium chloride, which is not good, okay, which comes to the surface. You also get strontium chlorides. So when you, so this flowback water, when it comes back, comes back with these chemicals, plus comes back with some reactions, which is barium chloride, strontium chloride, the heavy metals. Um, that, that's pretty much it. Those are the basic ones that you don't, you don't really want. Now, and norms. Naturally, and, and what? naturally occurring. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm glad you, I, I, I want to say, I, I have not seen this. I have never, I have, we, have, we have never seen any, any norm, and, and Pennsylvania will tell you the same thing, but norm, there is a testing protocol in the SGIS which says that you got to test it for norm. And if it's, if you find any norm above background, it's got to go, it's got to go this way to a to a norm facility. So it's a manageable problem. It's a manageable waste, just like water is a manageable <clears throat> problem. Yes. You say you've never seen it. To what extent was it actually looked for? Yeah. Well, the, we the, we were on we were on site. Uh, DEP was there from Pennsylvania, and actually <coughs> the diacotters, and we're looking for. They've done it uh, as extensively in Pennsylvania. And, and, and New York. When you say we, I thought you were talking about DEC. Well, we did. There were three studies done. Uh, one back in when I was there, back in the 80s, I think, late 80s. It's on the website if you want to look at it. Um, and there was another one done in, in, I think, the 90s. And then there was one more recently done for Marcellus. But in the SGIS itself, did they, uh, no, I take it back, in the DEC's um, study of whether or not to put brine fluids on roads, they did samples and they, they were doing fluids and cuttings, and they found that in about 10 to 30 percent of the samples they tested, they found norms. So of course you've seen it, if you know. Yeah, you're gonna get. That's yeah, in this yeah. state. But that doesn't mean it's beyond background. It's above background. It was above background. Okay, and I, it, I don't know that. It, I don't know. That. It, it was. It was about double, and it wasn't huge. They did calculations, and part of the reason the DEC approves the use of this radioactive material of the brine fluid on roads is they said, worst case scenario, it would be about three micro curies uh, of accumulated um, radioactivity. To me, that's still very concerning because they did find the radiation in their own sampling, and they don't know whether their samples that they did are really representative. It could be not as bad as that or worse yeah. than that. Well, go, well going but forward, that's, it's all going to be... That's data that the DEC has for New York State. And so to say that we would see norms in this fluid is, is <coughs> true. I mean, it's not just likely. It's already been demonstrated in the DEC's own testing. Typically, typically you get norm when, when 
uh, after something has been in the, in the hole for a while. So typically you get scaling on pipe and things like that. It's more, uh, it's more of a worker safety issue than it is uh, a health issue. Well, it's, if those um, pipes or cuttings or things from those pipes, or if you do a refracking, that you may remove some of that scale, and now it's in that material. And if that material is not handled as hazardous, um, I'm in glad yeah. to, to, you know, that, that I think that the notion of you test the fluid and if it, it does have radiation in it, you handle it as radioactive is good. But I'm not sure that they're applying those, I don't think they are applying those same standards to the cuttings and um, other fluids that come back out. Uh, I, I don't. I don't know. That's a detail that I just that's, can't, can't, I mean, I can't give you a complete answer to that. Um, I think the discussion, I, I get a feeling of the discussion that we've kind of explored each other's um, point of view, but maybe we could go to a, other topics besides the toxic uh, hazards. Uh, the, economic, uh, the economics of the issue, I think, are also worth looking at, uh, and, and there's some uh, debate about the, the actual uh, amount of gas that is really extractable and, the, uh, and, and, and how, uh, how, how long it will be um, available. People are saying there could be an upper 200 years worth of uh, uh, U.S. consumption, and, and, and other estimates say it might be only 10 years worth of, of consumption, and would we really uh, want to trade the um, um, potential of uh, toxifying our farmlands and our water supply for 10 years worth of gas when we might have other uh, economic alternatives, uh, green alternatives like solar and wind? Maybe you could frame that into a question. Can question you is, what, what do you think is the... Um, the projection of, of uh, how much gas is really available and how long it would last. Generally, generally, well, let's put it this way. Generally, um, when you have a, a, an oil and gas find, uh, you get uh, kind of like the speculation like this. Okay? In other words, the speculation is like this and the result is like this. In this case, uh, speculation was like this and the result is really like this. Okay? There are tremendous... Yes, sir? Over time. I, well, I, I think I curves that look completely different. They peak immediately and then they drop yeah, off. I'm not, talking about a, I'm not talking about a decline curve now. I'm just oh, talking okay. about a, a simple a simple uh, uh, view of what what I think, you know, now, now I'm giving you, now, now I'm you're telling finding you. You're more than you thought. Okay. I'm tell, yeah, you're finding more than you thought, exactly. Thank you. That's the simplest, simplest way. They're finding more than they thought, and they're finding, they're, they're becoming so efficient at recovering it. And by the way, your premise about toxifying the, the you know, I, 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 I told you we drilled 10,000 wells and not had one problem in the state. So I don't buy the premise that we're toxifying anything. Okay. Okay. Let, let me let me just answer that vertical versus horizontal because because I keep hearing this. There is nothing different between there is no environmental difference between fracking a well that's vertical or fracking it horizontally. The only difference is, and the reason why that this whole subject, uh, the, the, the 19, the, the SGIS is not a debate on hydrofracking. That's got nothing to do with the debate. The debate is on, it's not a debate. The 1992 GEIS never considered horizontal wells and never considered the volumes of water that are necessary to produce <coughs> To, to frack these wells. If from a legal standpoint, the state did the right thing by going back and supplementing the SGIS, the, I'm sorry, the GEIS, 
1992 with the SJS for horizontal wells, which were not available back then, and the, and the, and the industry and the, and the DEC, and they did the right thing in 2005 and 2008 by spacing these wells, by putting that in legislation to save time and effort. But we never considered, we considered 80,000 gallons for a frack job. Not a million gallons, not five million per well. So that's entirely new. And the other thing that's entirely new is now your uh, your length of time for drilling the well went from six weeks, which was the old the vertical well, to two months for the first well, and then we're going to come back another year. We're going to do two months for the second well, and we're going to drill a number of wells on a pad. Uh, so. The, the time and the impact to the community with truck traffic, bringing in water, all those things are new. And that's why they had to go to the GIS. The fracking, the, the environmental impact of that, the only difference between the horizontal well, and by the way, this is the way we're going to drill wells uh, in the future. You know, the, the only difference is that you're, you're, because it's horizontal, you're affecting more surface area of the formation, right? In other words, you're drilling right through the formation. And so as you affect more surface area, you're gonna you're gonna get hopefully get more gas. If you if it's you know more gas per surface area. But the but the frack itself, the fracking and all that is it, there's nothing different. But the difference that I think you're gonna see, and I think we're early enough into it, especially in these formations, is that that increased surface area of the explosions, it, you know, the, the vertical well, it's a, it's just a concentric circle around that. With the horizontal wells, it's miles and the frack in, in all different directions of the compass. And I think you're going to see the earthquakes that the um, United Kingdom's um, a committee did verify came from the epicenter, according to the geologic analysis, was the fracking site. They stopped the fracking, and the earthquake stopped. And that pattern of seeing earthquakes with fracking, stopping the fracking, and then seeing the earthquakes stop has been repeated many places. It is an emerging finding, but I think you're going to see that the environmental impact of trying to achieve that horizontal expanse is going to be much more major. And it's the um, earthquakes are a, a dramatic representation of that fracturing and interconnectivity that I think is, is going to be the problem with these wells that you don't see in the vertical wells. Well, you, you talk, you know, again, you talk about earthquakes ver versus fracking. And, and I haven't seen that. I haven't even, I'm not even aware of this Great Britain study, but, you know, I, I, I just don't believe it. But don't talk about explosions. This is not. This is no explosion. This is a. This is a gunshot that shoots, shoots a, a hole, basically a hole through a cement pipe. I mean, it's through a pipe, through the pipe, and through the cement. That's all it is. Well, we should. It's a perforation. The, the the reports that I've seen report pressures. I think of fifteen thousand psi and stuff like that. That are. It, I think correctly characterized as explosions. I don't know of a gunshot that generates that kind of pressure. But if I'm wrong on that, I... Well, I, I thought you were talking about the, the shooting of the hole through the, the thing. It's, I mean, when you, when you just think about it, you've got you've to gotta send fluid down, you've got to frack the far end, you've got to frack two miles away. So obviously you have to pressure up. Uh, but you, but you can't, you can't overpressure the formation. You can't overpressure this pipe. This pipe is very, uh, if you look at the casing and cementing guidelines, this, this pipe is all specified. What, what pressures it can take and there's safety factors built in. I mean, you can't, you can't pressure something and break the pipe. That's, so it's, it's uh, you know. How is that pressure achieved? Well, how is it done? It's, it's, a, it's done on the surface with, with uh, trucks, frack trucks. Yeah, pumps. Yeah, they're pumping, they're pumping fluid down there, and they keep, you know, pressuring it. How how far does the cement casing go down? All the way to the end. Yes. So wait, so if if they're ex 
exploding it, are they also exploding the pipe? But that doesn't. No, that's what I. That's you know what what you've got is you've got a little perforation. You you come down with a, a, a perf gun. That's basically what it's called. And and what it does is it shoots a little hole through the through through this pipe and through the cement. Uh, and then the pressure, the water pressure comes down and it pressures up and, 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 and breaks this formation, which the young lady calls an explosion. But it essentially breaks the formation and the sand is pushed up into the, into the cracks. And the reason for the sand is to keep those cracks open. So when the water flows back, those cracks stay open and the gas can flow. This is a very tight formation. What about James Northrup's comments that the 15,000 PSI is equivalent to a thermobaric <coughs> air bomb? I don't know what he says. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A thermobaric air bomb that can be heard 100 miles away in the air. That's what he says. I mean, that was his testimony. He says a lot of things. <laughs> uh, you know. He used to work in the industry. <laughs> You, you, you want to believe that you want to believe what you read on the internet. You want to believe him, and, and that's fine. I mean, I can't dissuade you from that. Yes. In one of these horizontal legs, how many holes? What size per hole? I don't know. How big is the hole? Small. Well, if it's small, how could How many? Go? How many perforations are there? I I don't, I don't you know you're asking me you questions. Call, you're asking okay. technical questions. I really don't know. I think, it, I think we'll hold off on the questions for a while and let the presenter go forward with as much as he can give us, and then we'll hit him with the questions after. So we have, uh, it's eight, five or eight, so why don't you just go ahead until nine? Till nine. Okay. So why don't you just go forward with what you have, and okay. then... Uh, Let's go back a certain to one, because if we keep it getting interrupted, we don't seem to uh, yeah. get beyond. I know Kathy back there is very, very smart <laughs> and has really good questions, but save them just for a moment. I was just going to write down what I wanted to do, and I forgot. Uh, here's, here's what... Here's what we have. We have a spectrum of energy choices, okay? Uh, and we have, on this side, we've got oil. And, and the reason why it's way over to the left is because we don't control the price of oil. It's dirty. Uh, it's costing us way too much money. All of our money is being exported. We don't allow the companies to drill offshore in New York and in the uh, U.S. Thank you, sir. By the way, one of the greatest experts. Could you hold the hell of Robert? I'm Please, sorry. can I just? I know. Sorry, but no, I know. I know you get emotional, but no, just give us a break and tell the man. This, the man is going to do a presentation, and then we're going to open up the questions. Okay. Fair enough, Robert. Uh, Please. Right. Fine. Okay. Because we, we, so we made a decision. We sport uh, gasoline. Facilitators so decided we're not going to allow what you're doing, Robert. Okay, I'm sorry. All right. okay. You're a gentleman, and All right. just Fine. please hold off. You, you'll get your opportunity. I'm, I'm talking in the I'm talking in the macro sense about our energy choices. We have oil on this side, which is not good for us. Not good because we're spending way too much money overseas instead of spending it here. Oil is bad, and we need to get off oil. Uh, in the middle, we've got nuclear. And we've got coal, both of which are, now we're into domestic. So this is good because it's now domestic. But they have their own problems, uh, nuclear and coal being dirty. Oh, but, but it is plentiful. Over here, we've got wind, solar, and natural gas, okay? All domestically produced. Uh, but we aren't going to get to solar and wind as an inter uninterruptible supply of resources, and certainly not in my lifetime, the, the 20 or 30 years I have left on the earth. Uh, so, and, and you're never going to power New York City on wind and solar on an in uninterruptible supply in the middle of winter. To provide gas. So the only solution we have is natural gas. 
Now, natural gas is clean. It is amazingly, you know, in, a, in the last election, if you, it, we have such a short memory about these things. We have nobody in the White House that knows anything about energy. We've had nobody in the White House for the last 20 years that's uh, known, any, known anything about energy. So, before, if you recall, in 2007, we had $150 oil, something like that. And, and we, you know, and I said, whoever gets elected is going to have a huge problem because there's no way that we're going to be able to dig our way out of this energy problem. Then, what happened? Then we find the Marcellus, and we find the Barnett, and these other shales, and we find a way to get at them through uh, drilling horizontal wells and hydrofract. And then, this Marcellus we find in our backyard in our backyard in depressed areas of the state, close to markets, uh, right next to our pipelines, you could have placed the formation in a better location. Now, I don't care whether we find true trillion cubic feet again, which to me is a huge number. We, New Yorkers, are producing 4% of our gas. Where are we going to get the other 96% from? Pennsylvania is now an ex- uh, exporter of gas already. Um, so it makes it makes all the economic and I don't and you know whether we want to talk about whether it's a thousand jobs or twenty thousand jobs, to me it doesn't make any difference either. Because jobs are jobs. Particularly in the Southern Tier, particularly for people who are uneducated. Because this is a this is an industry that can take high school kids and and give them a fifty to eighty thousand dollar job, and if they want to work, they can become supervisors, and they can they can provide for their families. So there's huge benefits. For the, and by the way, the oil and gas industry is the only industry that we have in this country that pays money to the landowner directly, then pays. And you know, we have in this state uh, uh, at Valora, we have a property tax. The property tax goes directly to the community. Uh, from it's, it's actually a production tax. That production tax goes directly to that was one of the other pieces of the 1981 legislation. So we don't yeah we don't have a severance tax. Everybody says oh we don't have a severance tax. Well uh, yeah that's right we don't have a severance tax. The state's not taking the money. It's going back to the community where it should go. And interestingly, it's a division of mineral resources that collects that information that goes to the tax assessors, which eventually goes back there. So. The industry doesn't look for a handout, pays the local local tax, they pay every single tax. They pay they pay the royalties and and, and uh, landowners, and they are um, uh, you know we, we just in, in, I'm, I'm from north of Albany, uh, between Albany and Saratoga Springs, and we just uh, put the AMD plant in up there in Malta. Uh, and there's a thousand people working and are now producing chips. But, but it costs the state one billion dollars in tax incentives for them to build here. And they had their hand off for another 660 million. So it's going to be a long time before we get back money. So to answer your question, uh, and, and, in my, and in my view, I said to the, uh, uh, the governor's uh, economic guy, I said, look, let's forget the jobs. Let's forget everything about the jobs. Let's forget everything about the, 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 uh, the immediacy of this thing. But let's just talk about the long term. And maybe we'll have 50 years of natural gas in our backyard in, in here. Maybe we'll have 100 years. Maybe we'll have 150 years. I said, do you know what that means? I said, that means that upstate New York is going to have water and is going to have energy for the first time ever. And you're going to have, if this happens, you're going to have investment coming back to upstate New York. Upstate New York is dead. There's nothing going on there. You talk to the construction guy, I'll tell you what, there would have been all kinds of bankruptcies on, you know, it's a, it's a terrible thing to say, but we would, we, you know, the thing that saved a lot of these construction companies was the flood. They have so much work to do now, uh, not, not just in Binghamton, but in, uh, uh, out in Schoharie Valley, 
I mean, these people, you wouldn't believe Schoharie. The town of Schoharie, 80% of the houses are gone. 80% in the, in the, in the village of Schoharie. I mean, it's, just, it's unbelievable. So, so that's what's kept them on. So, uh, I, don't, I don't, by any stretch of imagination, believe that any of this is jeopardizing the fresh waters of the state of New York. And the state of New York, as I said at the beginning, would never undertake anything that would ever jeopardize the, the water. Now, let me just go one step further and tell you that the way the SGIS is structured now, I don't think there's going to be any drilling in the state of New York. They've screwed up everything. And let me just go to, very quickly, I want to get to, I want to, the, the, the unsung, the thing that's, that's not talked about is this, that a five-acre well pad, okay? A five-acre well pad can drain 640 acres, which means you're disturbing five, five acres and you, can, and you can drain 640 acres. Tremendously efficient. And in Pennsylvania, they're taking 640 over this side, and they're drilling 1,280 acres with one pad. So, they're draining 1,280 acres with a five-acre pad. That's tremendous. As opposed to the old way in which we did vertical wells, was that 640 acres? Each one of these would have been 40 acres. That's 16 wells. That's probably probably two, two acres a well. That's a disturbance of 32 acres, plus all the rows that go around there. So it's a tremendous, tremendous advantage to, to produce gas this way. Now, what's happened in the SGIS is the ultimate mistakes. The SGIS says you can't drill within 4,000 feet of the, of the watershed. You can't drill in aquifers. We've been drilling aquifers for 100 years in the Jamestown Aquifer, by the way. You can't drill in a 100-year flood plain. Uh, you can drill in bayous in Pennsylvania. In, in, Louisiana, they've been doing that for 200 years. Drilling in the Gulf of Alaska for 30 years anyway. So you can't drill here, you can't drill here, you can't drill here, you can't drill here. The, the state says uh, there's 85, and you can't drill on state lands, which is another huge mistake. Not just for the state, but for the adjoining landowners who are landlocked, who Communities who don't who don't have a taxable base lose all that money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what's happened here is they put together. They thought that they were doing something to protect the resources by putting in by protect people by putting in all these restrictions, setbacks, prohibitions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They said 85 percent of the land was still available, and there's a map on the on the DC website which shows that shows all of that. As soon as I saw that, I said, you know, from my standpoint as a regulator, I said, that's wrong. That, that can't possibly be right. Because when you set, put a setback down, and when you put a prohibition down, you create unintended consequences. Believe me, I've gone through this in the mining program. I've gone through this in the oil and gas program. So, from Friday when they announced that to Monday, they said, well, it's not 85%, it's only 80%. And I said, that's not close either. And so a number of companies went out uh, over the next few months. Uh, and you'll see this reflected in the comments that IOGO of New York has made and API has made into the SJS. They went out and they looked at their positions, their lease positions, and tried to figure out where they're going to drill wells. And the, the fact of the matter is that only 40 to 50 percent of the land is available now to drill a well on the surface. Okay? So they've screwed it up big time. And what that means for the people is you're going to, you know, for the landowners who nobody seems to care about, you're going to leave a lot of uh, land that's not going to be developed, so you're, you're going to lose the gas from that. You're going to, you're going to, you know, essentially you've already uh, devalued any land 
from 100% to 50% or 40%. So the bonuses are gone. If you look around, there's no leasing companies in the state actively seeking leases, which means that's the kiss of death. They've all gone to Ohio and Pennsylvania. And by the way, the SGIS, with all the requirements in it, some of which are ridiculous, would cost a million dollars more to drill a well here than in, in, in Ohio or Pennsylvania. But the biggest problem is this. The 640 acres, if you can't drill over here, and you can't drill over here, and you can't drill over here, you've created a situation where you're going to drill more wells. And therefore, you're going to have more environmental impact. So what DEC has done is, is re, remove the drilling efficiencies in the process from the 640, the five acres, the 640. And they've created a morass that's going to cost more money, that's going to cost, that's going to recover less gas, that's going to be uneconomic, uncompetitive, but most of all, it's going to create much more environmental impact, which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. So unless DEC makes major changes to the prohibitions and setbacks, these you know, I couldn't get the companies to even respond to requests for car on some of some of these companies. And I'm talking about major companies now because I was helping API put their comments together. Um, they're gone. So, so it's not, you know, I, I don't see it happening under this scenario unless things change. Now, I know a lot of you are going to say, oh, that's good. That's great. But get back to my spectrum question here. Where, where, where are you going to get your gas from? Pennsylvania? Where are you? You know, what is it that we're going to, uh, why, should, why should we be uh, importing 96% of our natural gas? Why shouldn't, we, why shouldn't we take responsibility for our energy choices? And if we're going to close down Indian Point, what are we going to do about that? How are we going to supplement our, our existing electric generation? And by the way, natural gas can save, uh, you know, natural gas, excuse me, natural gas is not prevalent in New England. So you've got, my, my daughter's in, in the, the most uh, heavily uh, uh, residential community in New Hampshire, and they don't, have, they don't have natural gas lines. So there's a tremendous market. We're the gateway. We're the gateway to New England. We have uh, we have 26 storage reservoirs in New York that store natural gas. I mean, this is this is an important consideration for for us, uh, both to have gas from un uninterruptible supply. You recall the old days? We had Texas over here. We had one pipe, basically one pipe, to come to to, to New York. And we, if we had a a problem with that pipe, like a hurricane, we don't get gas. Well, now they've got all kinds of what they call hubs, all kinds of things. It's, it's a much, much more sophisticated system where where we can't where, where uh, uh, we can get we can get gas, but we couldn't before. So I think I'll stop right there. Do you want any questions from the audience? I'm uh, happy yeah. to take questions. Good. Okay. You choose whoever you want. Let's take the gentleman in the back since I haven't had. Number one, I appreciate what you've said, and I believe that you believe, and probably is actual fact of what you're saying is correct, if the industry played by the rules. And I think the general consensus is of people in this audience and people that I know is that we just can't trust the industry, though, to play by the rules. And so, and I don't know how you convince us that that's going to happen because the industry has a bad reputation. It seems to me. Yeah, see, years. see, that that's that's a problem. And, you know, and you're right. That's a problem because nobody likes the oil and gas industry. Nobody likes the oil and gas industry for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, some of which are we don't like fossil fuels. We don't like this. We don't like that. Um, you know, the oil and gas industry uh, back in the '70s had probably the worst, the oil guys came here to New York and they basically told the governor, we're going to drill offshore in New York and you guys can go stick it. That's basically what they told the governor. And the governor, you know, when I was in the middle of that, the governor said, no way, no how. You, you guys don't, you know, what you did in Pennsylvania, what you did in Louisiana and Texas doesn't go here. 
So the, so the oil guys have always had a problem with their image. They've never done things right. Gas guys are uh, a much higher regulation with a public service commission and everything. They have a they have a different view. Now, let me just tell you my experience after 1991. Just like a parent, okay, you have to explain your, your expectations to, to the regulated community. You got to tell them, this is the way we want things done. This is the way you have to do it. And if you don't do it, you're going to get fined or whatever. Okay? So in, 19, in 1981 to, I don't know, maybe even 91, we collected a million dollars in fines. It wasn't even that long. But we collected a million dollars in fines and penalties. And that money went into a fund to plug abandoned wells. We were taking, and the whole idea was to get it built up to a million dollars, take that money, and to use the interest from it to plug the wells. So, the good news about the oil and gas guys is they have to come back to you for another permit. So, if they didn't do what we told, we didn't give them a permit. Now, is that legal? No. Probably not. Was it effective? Very effective. So, in a short period of time, over six years, and, and I would tell you that this is, you know, fines and penalties are not the way to gauge a program. You should, you should have zero fines and penalties if you get from them, if, if you set the expectations and you, and you get them to do what you want. And so we collected very few fines and penalties after the initial, you know. And in fact, in, in 1981, the first thing that happened is that the president of the Iowa says to me, now it's your job to weed out the bad actors. And in the 1980s, before the tax changes were made in 1986, Every dentist, every doctor, they are all out there drilling wells, making a freaking mess in New York. Uh, because they could get tax advantages, but they didn't care whether they produced gas or oil. It didn't matter uh, until, until 86 when they changed things. So, uh, and we did. We weeded out a lot of those people and we got rid of them. Now, the million bucks, legislature took it in, in 1991 or 92. So we never did see, after all, all that saying, they said, what do you need to use it? I said, well, that was the whole point, not to use it, to build it up to use the interest. But anyway, that's a long way around to say it. Our experience with the oil and gas guys, particularly the oil and gas guys that are going to be in this industry, in New York, we're not going to have small actors. Nobody's going to, these guys are going to be spending